everyone, and welcome to another episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black, coming to you live, yes, all the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Happy New Year! I haven't seen y'all since, I don't know, the week after the election. I took some time off. I wanted to do some rebranding. I wanted to show y'all I've been tightening up my skills. You know, if I've been doing this thing since 2017, but if you don't grow and you don't change, then nobody's going to get down with you. So if you notice, I got a decent background now. I'm uh, using technology to enhance the visuals, add a little background to it. So that's all I'm doing, just trying to make the experience a little better. And listen, uh, haters going to hate, but I'm going to let y'all know, I felt like the first show of the night should be my first lady. So before I go into my rant, my rants, when yo boo, when yo boo is running for re-election, she gotta be the first one. She gotta be. Y'all, someone that I love dearly, you know, y'all know I say I love everybody, but like, I really love her. Like she like, I, and she cute, but I don't wanna like detract from the fact that she's brilliant, smart, and capable, but she is running for re-election for the Bloomington City Clerk. Uh, y'all give it up for the Honorable Nicole Bolden. Nicole, welcome to the show. Thank you, and thank you for that lead in. It only made me just a little. Oh. What? I mean, I don't be lying or nothing. God, you kill me. You kill me. But thank you. Thank you so much for having me tonight. So, it's great to be here. So, how was your holiday? And if you don't uh, say was, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. It was amazing. It was good. We stretched it out over a couple of weeks because of some travel and illness issues. And that just made it so much better because, you know, Christmas season is my favorite holiday season. I love it. Yes, yes, I know. Yeah. And I have a cute Grinch <laughs> outfit to prove it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, so the original you, Grinch. You know, I got a rent. Um, and so yep. we're going to do a little differently because I, you know, you and I talk about a lot of things on a regular basis. So let's just make this a lot of fun and we're going to chop it up. So I'm going to bring up some news articles and then eventually we'll go into your campaign and how people can help you. And oh, by the way, I got to okay. tell you with uh, every show that I have candidates on, these will be mini fundraisers. So if you like what these candidates are talking about and you want to contribute to their campaign, click on their Act Blue link because I know every Democrat in Indiana is going to have an Act Blue account. Y'all going to have an Act Blue account, right? Yeah. Anyway, click on the link, uh, donate to her campaign. So my first rant, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, the Indianapolis Star reports Governor Eric Holcomb, Holcomb is calling for a record-breaking increase in funding for the state's K-12, K-12 schools as part of a $43 billion two-year budget proposal. Over the course of the next two years, Holcomb is calling on the state to spend $5.5 billion more than it did during the previous two years. In addition, to the $1.2 billion increase in K through 12 tuition support. He's calling for a major investment in the state's public health system, a boost in higher education spending, and, and a raise for state employees and others around the economic development grant for local communities. Should his budget be adopted, Holcomb would push for the bulk of these new dollars to continue going toward teacher pay with the goal of raising the state's average to $60,000 before he leaves office. Uh, Nicole, Clerk Bolden, do you think, uh, yes, do you think the General Assembly and that supermajority Republic, Republican Senate and House is going to acquiesce to our governor's requests? I certainly hope so. I mean, I, I never, I'm always a little surprised when I see the things they do and don't vote for, but I think at a certain point they have to acknowledge that our teacher's pay is just racing toward the bottom of the country and it's time to do something about it. So I hope they approve it. I hope they go in on it. I know there will always people who will say no, but I do hope that it passes. I do too, but my concern is, you know, you've been there six years now you didn't 
think to do these things before. And you know he's going to throw his hat in for U.S. Senate because him and Mike Braun apparently have a pact that they're going to switch offices. Really? Yeah. Word on the street. Oh. Word on the street. I mean, I don't I don't have insights like that. I don't I don't be hanging out with them them red folks like that. I, I just don't. But word on the street. But doesn't it seem kind of odd that Brian is giving He's only been in the Senate for one term. Isn't it kind of odd that they switch in roles? Well, anyway, there's going to be a lot of gubernatorial candidates, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. No, I mean, I, we can if you want to. But I, I think sometimes people do things in their last year or two in office that they couldn't get done before. And they kind of say, this is my last shot. So I think you see a lot of bold moves from people who are planning on leaving office. This may be one of them. Yeah, I, so. I hope it is. I hope it is. I mean, but I, my concern is, you know, the supermajority has veto override. And yeah. they can pretty much ignore anything that this guy says, which is what they've been doing. So I'm concerned that even though he's making the requests, they're going to be ignored and they're going to fall on deaf ear. Okay, so what's happening? Because usually I'm the like doom and gloom person and you're like optimistic. And this time I'm more optimistic and you are definitely more pessimistic. It's not about I, pessimism. It's about truth and facts. Realism, no, pragmatic. I, mean, like, I, don't... I mean, where's the lie? Like these clowns, I mean, I, okay, these guys in the state house, they, they focus in on... Well, I mean, I don't want to do that because you're a candidate and, you know, but, but it, I mean, you would think like, you know, at some point they would value um, what uh, Hoosiers are talking about, but in that state house, and we've seen over the last couple of years, especially that hideous special session we had, they don't care what we talk about. We want to legalize marijuana. No. We want to protect abortion rights. No. We want to pay our teachers. Eh, no. You, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, maybe it's a pattern. Maybe, but we don't know yet. So I think watch and see might be worth this one. I'm, I'm, I'm hope I'm holding out hope for. Yeah. So I'm going to cross my fingers and my toes, and I'm going to hope for it because honestly, that's the best we can hope for. And people care about their kids, or they say they do. They say they care about their education, and they recognize if there aren't teachers, that's a problem. So hopefully the long view will win out over short-term gains. So, so my, too. my is sincere hope is that people are looking toward the future and recognizing where we are with our educational system as a whole and saying, we need to invest in this. And I think it's great also the idea of eliminating textbook fees and some of the other things that go along with the proposal. Great. So I hope they can negotiate something out because this is important. Yeah. And yeah, you know. I agree. I, I hope they do too, because, um, you know, an, an uneducated society leads to a whole lot of bad stuff. <laughs> and uh -huh. that's all I'm, I mean, I mean, honestly, like tomorrow's anniversary. I don't know. You know, people thinking that the uh -huh. vice president of the United States could actually overturn the election. I mean, who people who don't know civics and I mean, bad things can happen when people aren't educated. I don't know. Uh, I do want to talk about a couple of things. Cherish, Cherish Pryor, Representative Cherish Pryor is going to introduce a, a, quite a few bills that I think are fascinating that I want to read to you guys. Um, she filed three bills uh, December 27th, and she had uh, put it up on her social media page. Uh, HB 1051, uh, this is a, a bill on property tax relief. It would provide property tax relief for long-term homestead property owners who are seeing drastic increases in their property tax bills. Um, we want to keep an eye on that. That's something that will benefit everyone, even though she comes from Marion County, that will benefit everyone, right? Um, this one, though, I find really fascinating. HB 1052, malicious, or malicious false reporting. This bill allows someone to bring a civil lawsuit against a person who falsely calls law enforcement on them. It also allows recovery of damages. Now, I, I, do you see why I'm hyped about it? I know, I know it's not going to get a hearing. It's probably not going to get a hearing. But what are your thoughts on someone like uh, Representative Cherish Pryor introducing a bill? And, 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 and the funny part is a lot of people don't even understand why she would even introduce it. So I know you do, Clerk Bolden. Uh, why would she introduce such a bill? <laughs> I, I'm not going to answer for her. 
I'm, I'm really not. I, I'm glad that she has introduced this bill. I think it's important that people don't get, you know, the police call on them when they're walking down the street in a neighborhood that maybe they're not used to seeing people in or shopping or playing music in a park or doing any number Sleeping of things that dorm, people normally do. Driving their car, yeah. reading a book, listening to music, jogging anything. in the park. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I hope that's her goal, which is that people don't get the police called on them frivolously. I, I love it. I mean, I, the whole move. And she's always been a champion yeah, for people yeah, all yeah. around the state. So I am grateful to her um, for running for office, for going into the state house day after day when mm -hmm. they're in session. And even if she thinks there's no chance of it getting a hearing or anything else, she still does the work. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think it's great. I I love this yeah. bill. When I saw it, my, my heart leaped because, you know, we saw Republicans introducing bills that said, if you protest in the street, we can run you over. <laughs> but I never saw anything, you know, from anyone saying, okay, well, what about the people who are just minding a damn business and somebody calls the police on them because they think they look suspicious. I like this bill. I don't know if it's going to get a hearing, but I mean, Anytime somebody puts that much effort into protecting our community, I wanted to at least let y'all know. So keep an eye out on HB 1052. It's an amazing bill. She also uh, introduced another bill that I like. Um, it's HB 1053. HB, this bill prohibits law enforcement agencies and law enforcement officers from conducting discriminatory profiling or pretextual stops based upon an individual's perceived age, gender, race, or ethnicity. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, that's kind of a... There are so many other reasons that you could pull someone over. Part of me says, eh. That one's not going to fly. Well, I mean, even if you got it passed, how would you enforce it? I, yeah. I'm I'm curious about that bill, and I haven't read it yet. So yeah, I haven't either. I, I haven't either. I don't know what's in the text of it. I want to read it though. Yeah. Um, I always feel just a little bit behind you because you like pull up the bills, look at them, and everything else, and I'm like three or four days behind you, going, "Wait, what? 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 What do I read? What do I read?" That's so because I'm a junkie. You well, know, you know I'm a junkie, baby. <laughs> uh, this I know, but sometimes I'm always sitting there going, "Oh man." How did I meet such a nerd? So uh, really, R really, no, it, no. it takes one to know one nerdy nerd. And we're going to get into your nerd uh, stuff. Don't even worry about that. I announced to a room full of people today that I was a huge nerd. So I'm, I'm ready I for love it. it. I mean, br smart people are, are very attractive. I love incredibly smart people. I'm, <laughs> I'm there for it. All right, let me keep awesome. going with, I'm, this is like a, a really soft rant because I ain't really going off, but it's so much better you're, talking you're not to you. Ranting. I'm yeah, talking to you, but... but it's so much more fun that way. Um, okay, so, um, all right. So apparently uh, the General Assembly is not going to introduce any new uh, abortion restriction bills, which I think, okay, cool. They don't, they probably shouldn't. I mean, they. I think they've done enough damage, but the AP reports Indiana's Medical License Board next month will hear, hear a case regarding the Indianapolis doctor who this past summer provided an abortion to a 10-year-old rape victim from Ohio. The February 23rd hearing is the first step in determining the medical license status of Dr. Caitlin Bernard, uh, an Indi Indianapolis obstetrician whom the Indiana Attorney General Punko Punk 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 uh, Tavarkita claimed violated privacy laws after Bernard spoke to an Indianapolis newspaper about the Ohio girl's treatment. Uh, attorneys for Bernard state the doctor followed Indiana's abortion and child abuse reporting requirements while the child's case was being investigated by Ohio authorities, court document from December show. The case drew, drew national attention uh, in the week after the U.S. Supreme Court, blah, 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 blah. After the newspaper cited the, that, that case in a July 1st article about patients heading to Indiana for abortion uh, because of more restrictive laws elsewhere, Indiana Attorney General Ty Rikita told Fox News he would investigate Bernard's actions, calling her an abortion activist acting as a doctor. Uh, Bernard filed a lawsuit against Rikita, blah, blah, blah. So, um, 
what is what has me disturbed about this particular thing is that she did everything right. So re, if I don't know if you guys remember, um, Tyra Keita went on Fox News, said, oh, my God, we're going to investigate. We can't seem to find any information on whether or not this chick actually t- turned in all her stuff. But then all the uh, newspapers, even Fox News said, um, we were able to get it right here. She did everything. She followed the law. He couldn't get her on doing something nefarious or untoward the patient. So now they're going to say, well, she wasn't supposed to talk about it. So there had to be some patient doctor privileges or some HIPAA violations in there. So now this woman who provided a service to a 10 year old rape victim that saved that 10 year old's life has to go argue about whether or not she should be able to keep her medical license. I find this incredibly disturbing because it's not like she is being sued for malpractice. It's not like she did anything that uh, was unethical in the sense of the law or in, in the sense of what she does as a doctor. This is a political stunt to drag a, 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 a woefully qualified doctor through the mud for providing a service to protect and save a 10 year old girl's life because dudes, these guys out here don't seem to recognize that a 10 year old girl's body more than likely is not prepared for to deliver a baby, right? So they don't know anything. And this clown decides, well, I'm going to keep on dragging her through the mud. Now, one of the things that we find uh, at odds here in Indiana, we're having a hard time keeping talent. We're having a hard time keeping educated people here in Indiana, and we already have a shortage of doctors and nurses anyway. If you were Dr. Bernard, why would you stay in Indiana? You can go provide your services somewhere else where you're not being dragged through the mud by a politically motivated attorney general who really doesn't have a case. He just wants to keep your name out there. These are my opinions. What say you, Nicole Bolden, on this? I, why would you say that she should leave? Or I'm not saying leave? that she should leave. I, I, would, I don't want her to leave, but these are the consequences of actions of people when they feel attacked. It's just... It, it makes them want to go, is what you're saying. Yeah, but, I don't want her to leave, no. I mean, maybe she's one of those people who will fight harder when she gets attacked. And like me? Yeah. Because there are some people who walk away and some people who stand up and fight harder. Um, I, I don't know which type of person she is, but man, do I appreciate the fact that she's here because there aren't many doctors who are willing to do that kind of work. It's dangerous. Yes, it is. You know? And why? And so, why? It should not be dangerous. It should not be dangerous but, to do what you got a license to do. I know. But, you know, this is not... I mean, it's deliberate, you know, it's deliberate and it's in, and it's intended to have a chilling effect on other practitioners. I mean, mm-hmm. it's meant to say, when you do this, we're going to come after you in every possible way that we can. We're going to come after you in criminal ways or malpractice or your medical license. We're going to make it so difficult for you to do that which you are legally allowed to do that you were no longer going to want to do it. So I think the people who actually do this type of medicine, who actually are performing life-saving procedures for people need to stand up and they're already, they're already doing work at a level that most people can't imagine because the average person doesn't go to work and worry about somebody trying to kill them for the work that they do. The average I mean, there are some people who are in that particular dangerous line of work, Mm -hmm. but for a doctor to be doing this. So yeah, I hope she's one of those people who stands up and says, no, you're not going to chase me out. And I I hope that other people who are coming through medical schools or in the medical profession, because it's not just the doctors, it's also Mm -hmm. the medical assistants and the nurses and everybody else who work in these clinics. Mm -hmm. And um, it is it's very dangerous. I have somebody that I love a great deal who works in one of these clinics and I worry about them. And so this case is something that I've been paying a great deal of attention to because it's, it hits a little bit closer to home. It really does. And, and the, the, the point that I'm making, like you, you said that no one should fear for their life going to do their job. 
that that was the point that I was making. Like, why would I work somewhere where I'm going to be in fear of my life for doing my job when there are other states, other places that I can go? Hopefully she will stay. Hopefully, hopefully there isn't, it isn't a ter- deterrent for her to leave. And she re- recognizes the, you know, um, the lack of real health care and practitioners here in the state. And she stays. I wanted her to stay. But there's also you know, that, that chance. Yeah, I know there's that chance. And it reminds me of something, um, well, your sister said once, because somebody said, well, why not go somewhere else where you can do this thing? And she said, I shouldn't have to. Yeah. That's real talk right and, there. And she shouldn't have to leave the state where she has built her practice, where she presumably has family and or friends and a life. She shouldn't have to leave because somebody doesn't like what she does. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. But it's something that, uh-huh. you know, well, I just, and so what do you think about Tyra Kitty even coming after her? Like, s- s- still, still trying to I'm flex. I'm greatly disappointed mm. in his actions, but maybe not entirely surprised. Right, right. Um, I, I think sometimes people will latch onto an idea like a dog with a bone and they won't let go of it, even when they know it's not good. Yeah, and so. it's just, it doesn't help our state. It doesn't make us look good in the eyes uh, of the country. Yeah, I'm, I'm not as worried about looking good, but I, I am worried about doing what's right and legal. And I, I think this is a stretch for yeah. his role. But, um, you know, again, he does not call me for advice. I wish he did. <laughs> you know? I, wish he, I wish he did, too, because then maybe, you know, he, he would know that. Um, anyway. Yeah. All right. But, yeah. But okay, so so they they did the thing. They're taking her to court. Uh, she, well, she's got to you know fight for her law license. But this is some good news. Medical, medical license. Thank you. What I say, law. You did. <laughs> Stop rubbing off on me. Cut it out. You little leader, right. mind you. You little yeah. Her medical license. But this yeah. is some good news for those women who believe that they should have a choice in their bodies. Um, uh, political reports. The Justice Department has cleared the U.S. Postal Service to deliver abortion drugs to states that have strict limits on terminating pregnancy and has offered limited assurances that a federal law addressing the issue won't be used to prosecute people criminally over such mailings. A legal opinion from Justice's Justice's Office of Legal Counsel concluded that a, that a nearly 150 year old statute aimed at fighting vice through the mail is not enforceable against mailing of abortion drugs as long as the sender does not know that the drug will be used illegally. We conclude that the statute does not prohibit the mailing or the delivery or receipt by mail of the medicine where the sender lacks the intent that the recipient of the drug will use them unlawfully. There are manifold uh, manifold ways in which recipients in every state may use these drugs, including to produce an abortion without violating the state law. Therefore, the mere mailing of such drug to a particular jurisdiction is an insufficient basis for concluding that the sender intended them to be used unlawfully. So their, their thought behind that was, if in some states, uh, in case of medical emergency or the, the the welfare of the mother, then abortion is legal. And because the sender doesn't necessarily know what the health status is of the mother, they don't know if it's going to be used illegally or not. It could be very well being going to be used legally. I think this is good news. I think this is actually fantastic news because that means, okay, if you're comfortable with medically, uh, you know, prescription induced, medically induced abortion methods, then in Indiana, you can still receive that through mail order. And the sender won't get prosecuted. You won't get prosecuted. Now, you know, just be careful because, you know, they be trying to have them bounty hunter laws out there, be all up in your business and try to go go be tattletale, whatever. But this is good news, I think. What are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's, I think it's great news. I'm, you know, I I look at these things and it just I'm still struggling with 
the notion that we have had a reversal of rights in our states. So the idea that now we have to go through and get opinions on whether or not we can send medication through the mail and what it means in terms of prosecution levels and medical care is just, it it blows my mind. So um, I'm, I'm so frustrated (laughs) and um, it's, I, I'm speechless, clearly. I lost my word. (laughs) I'm sorry. I think it's great that you lost your words on a podcast, but it's okay. I love you for that. I I mean, yeah, that's great. Because I'm sure everybody (laughs) listening is like going, great, gibberish. But um, that's it. I I have no more work on this one, clearly. I think that's just a good one. And it's kind of a, ha, to all those people uh, in the state house who were like, I'm I here representing Jesus when you were supposed to be representing your constituents. Not the saying that, you know, yeah, love your Jesus, but you, he didn't vote for you. Uh, Jesus didn't cast not one vote in the Indiana election last year. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I, I'm not wrong. Did, did you, I'm, I'm gonna ask Myla. She, I'm gonna ask, she was the clerk of Marion County. I'm gonna see if Jesus casted a vote, but I don't know. You stop. I don't think he did. Stop, All right. Stop, stop. Okay. I got some I got some sad news. We're gonna end this half hour with this. Mm-hmm. This is really, really sad news to me. The current reports, Zionsville Mayor Emily Styron oh. has announced she will not seek re-election. In 2019, Styron defeated Republican incumbent Tim Hack to become the town of uh, Zionsville's first Democratic mayor. Styron wasn't immediately available for comment. But public information officer Amanda Vela confirmed that mayor, the mayor's decision, January 3rd, not to seek re-election, Styron issued the following statement. I have decided not to seek re-election in 2024. Um, together with the town, well, I guess it was 2023. Uh, together with ta- uh, town employees, we have accomplished our primary goal related to innovative economic and community development and preserving and growing our green spaces. We are not going to take our foot off the gas this year. And I took, I look forward to continuing full speed ahead to move our town forward. Uh, I'm saddened by this because she was like, she's one of my favorites. Amazing. Yeah, she was one of my, I mean, she's one of my favorites. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I remember seeing her when we were up at a JD Ford oh. event um, and, and, you know, she oh. talked about yeah, she gave that insight on, you know, who people are and what they do um, and being okay with who you are, right? And she always said that she was a big per- picture person. Um, and she just is a sweet person. I, I had her in-house to do her interview because it was pre-COVID. And I remember talking and she was like, yeah, I'm not. Gonna, I'm only going to do so much because I have a son. I mean, she had all of her priorities in place and she ran a good race. I'm sad that she's not going to be one of our mayors, um, especially in San Diego. Yeah, yeah, and we don't have a lot of Democratic mayors around the state, so um, the loss of one of our incumbents is real. And she is she's a very kind person. I've talked to a lot of mayors around the state um, from both sides of the aisle, and I think she is just one of the kindest people that Absolutely. you can meet. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, I, I'm hoping that even though she's step, stepping away from the political space, that there's an opportunity for us to like go have dinner, have lunch, coffee. I just enjoy talking to her. You know what I'm saying? Like she just. Well, she's, you know, she's still around. So I, think I know, I know. Or email. It's just, you know, it will be in a different capacity. People move on. I know. Um, I know. Unfortunately. So. Yeah, but you know and- me, babe. I, I get to talk about politics and I drive people crazy. Well, that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> hey, before we get into uh, Nicole's uh, discussion about Clerk Nicole Bolden's reelection, uh, Democrats, do you need audio and visual video visual equipment for your event? Are you a candidate that is looking for an affordable uh, way to create content? Then look no further than Black Pearl Studios, a subsidiary of Black Pearl IT Solutions. Black Pearl IT Solutions can provide many of the communications wraparound services any Democratic organization needs. No matter the size or budget, Indiana's own has you covered. Visit the website www.blackpearlit. Uh, wait a minute, let me say it again. www.blackpearl-its.com for more information. Y'all, I'm here to help y'all win elections. That's it. 
That's all. I have all the tools you need. Holla at your girl. All right. Okay, now let's talk about the fabulous, fabulous Nicole. Tell the people who you are and where you come from. So my name is Nicole Bolden. I live in Bloomington, Indiana. I'm the Bloomington City Clerk. I was first elected in 2015, um, re-elected in 2019, and I'm running for re-election this year. I filed yesterday, so that was, um, that's exciting. It I'm is. excited about it, you know? So, uh, and I'm very, very lucky. I have a great group of people that I work with. I really enjoy um, my job. Actually, I love my job. And um, so I'm looking forward to this year because, you know, it's a good chance to get out and talk to my community and knock on doors and not have people look at me funny and think I'm begging for candy. So, <laughs> you know, this is this is good. Well, looking forward. What, so, OK, there's a there's a couple of different kinds of clerks out there. You're a yeah. city clerk. A lot of people don't know what the city clerk does. What does the city clerk do? So uh, my new shorthand description for describing the city clerk is I describe it as the memory for the city. I'm the city clerk, also known as clerk of the council, also known as, you know, we catch everything in our office. But we keep the city's ordinances and resolutions and keep track of all the council's meetings. And um, we also handle parking ticket appeals and deeds and certified bonds and a lot of the detail work that you don't think of that goes into municipal government but needs to be handled comes through my office. It differs from the county clerk because the county clerk, at least inside class cities and smaller, um, is the clerk of the courts so they handle things that are handled with the courts but for us it's city council and so we work really closely with the city council and the mayor's office to make sure that things are done the nice thing about the clerk's office is when it's running smoothly you probably won't hear a lot from us unless you need something directly from the office so it's um it's a, it's a nice job oh and we get to officiate weddings which is one of my favorite things. I know I perked up on that, but <laughs> officiating weddings is just so much fun and I love it. And when I get to do it for um, friends or family, I, it's very special. So, so I you, cry. so this is I your, love. this is, you're running for reelection for your third term. For my um, third okay. term. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, uh, you know, you said you're the memory of uh, the city, why does that fascinate you? You know, it's not something I ever thought I would do growing up. It's not like I thought one day I'm going to be a city clerk, far, far from it. But uh, there was something when I first got into the office and I, I remember I was only gonna be there for a few weeks and it's what, 14 years later. <laughs> um, so clearly I didn't have my plans well thought out, but when, I got into the office and it was in the first couple of days where somebody called the office and they asked for some help. I think it was relative to smell like a pothole and realizing that we could take action on it, make a couple of phone calls and that pothole was filled within a day or so. And that was amazing to me. It was like, wow, we get to be here in city government helping people that quickly and that directly, which you don't get to see very often. I mean, yeah, you can write to the governor or the president or somebody in the state house, but it takes a little bit more time to get that direct response. And to be the memory, there are things that happen in our city government. And somebody will say, well, when was the last time this happened? And it's one of those great things to say, hey, I've got that right here. And here's a list of all the mayors that we've had since we incorporated, or here are all the clerks, or um, this is the original city charter for the city of Bloomington, which I, I um, love that we have it in our office. And it's this great big book. If I could have brought it home to show you, I would, but that probably is not ideal, but it is hmm. just beautiful. And you can see, um, where the city of Bloomington became Bloomington officially, you know, and that 
It's amazing. So anybody, if you're ever in Bloomington or if you're in Bloomington now and you want to see the original city charter, just come by my office and we'll, you know, pull it out. We have to keep it in a special safe so it's protected. But um, that's what I mean by being the city's memory, which is there are things that happen that we need to refer to. And sometimes people just don't know when it happened or what was there or what additional paperwork was going on. And a lot of those things are kept in our files and some of them will never be used, but some of them will. And I, I love that. And for me, I struggle sometimes to remember what I had for breakfast, but knowing that <laughs> the things I do at work are written down, documented is just, it's wonderful to me. I love so it. I love yeah. It. And yeah, I, I did that thing where I got all excited That's, about. Well, I wanted you to because Sorry. I want I want people to to feel how much you enjoy doing the job and understand um, why it's important to have someone who's passionate about the work being in that position. And if you like what Miss Nicole Bolden, Clerk Nicole Bolden, has talked about, please remember to click on her um, Act Blue donation link. Or if you're listening to this on a podcast, go to actblue.com, type in Nicole Bolden, and you will be able to find her link and donate to her campaign and make it a recurring. I'm just saying. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so you do other things though. Like I, you talked about like you do a community engagement thing. What is that all about? The community. Like oh, you mean through the office or do you mean? Yeah, through the office, yeah, through the office. Through, no, through the office. We're going to talk about, you know, all the good stuff that you do later, but through the oh, office, I, you do like a, what is it? A constituency, something, something, something. Oh, well, through the office, we do a lot of, um, We'll talk to student groups or local groups or whomever wants to come in to City Hall and get like an overview of city government or boards and commissions. So we do a lot of outreach like that. And um, so I, I think that's what you're referring to. So, for example, earlier today, I was talking to Leadership Bloomington Monroe County, which is a group of residents who are interested in government, city and county government, and they do a leadership program. So I was able to go and talk to them, which was really, I enjoy doing those kinds of conversations. And I always try and go early because usually they're also talking to other elected officials. So today I got to hear from um, County Councilor Deckard and City My Council. Demos. Yes, <laughs> and City Council uh, Jim Sims and the County Commissioner Julie Thomas. And it's always, fascinating to listen to not only what other government officials are saying about our community, but also the questions that people are asking of them. Um, because sometimes there are things that I don't anticipate, or I can tell the others aren't anticipating, but they are willing to dig in and start answering those questions. So it's, it's another chance to talk to people and see what they want from their government. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes we get detached and we don't get a chance to really talk to our representatives in the way that we need to. So this is a good chance to sit down in a space with a bunch of like-minded people and say, this is what we do. And what questions do you have and how can we serve you better? So, but then you oh. have like a, a, um, what is it? You said the constituency, like you would bring this people in and you do the, Oh, never mind. I can't remember. I can't see if I can remember the name of it then, but you always get hyped about it because you do it like once a month. I don't. Okay. It's okay. Maybe yeah. I'm making it up. Maybe I'm just, well, it might be something else that I do that you're thinking about. So that's also, okay. Got it. Got it. Got, so, it. Yeah. Got it. So, um, one thing I know that you guys take care of, and I'm certain everyone in Bloomington is going to want to know this. You take care of parking tickets too, don't you? Oh, don't say we take care of them. Because oh, okay. we don't take care of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I, I I got a call today where somebody said, are you going to take care of this for me? And I was like, um, I'm going to walk you through how you handle a parking <laughs> ticket appeal. So we adjudicate parking ticket appeals, which is, it's like the last relic. The city clerk used to be the, um, well, actually used to be the judicial branch of the city government. So, oh. and that got yeah, so we have our old city seals, and I still have the um, the one with the scales of justice actually mm -hmm. in my office. It's kind of cool, but the hearing the parking ticket appeals are kind of the last 
little thing that we have that we still do. And it's an informal adjudication where people will come in if they get a parking ticket and they think it was written in error, then they can appeal their parking ticket and say, you know, this is why I got a parking ticket and this is why I think it was wrong. Mm -hmm. Or if they have some really outstanding circumstances that led to them getting a parking ticket. And I think the one that I've used is if like you tripped and fell on your way back to your car and had, you know, some sort of injury that's <laughs> delayed your return, which is a horrible, horrible example. But at the same time, you know, that's it. It's not parking ticket appeals are not for people who are like, well, you know, my meter only expired 10 minutes before I got back to it. Well, that that's why you get a parking ticket. But you know, we, we see that. And it's an interesting thing because we, um, a lot of people will get parking tickets and just pay them without thinking about it. And then there are a lot of people who are like, no, I'm going to fight every single one. And then okay. I show everybody else. Well, that's, I mean, okay. that's good to know where, I mean, it, you know, if you have to deal with a parking ticket, you know, at least yeah. people know where to go. Well, so, and that's where I started in the office, which was doing uh, parking ticket appeals full time. So um, my first six years in the office, that was my job. So I talked to a lot of unhappy people. I bet you did. Jeez. Oh, yeah. And you, and you stayed sweet, didn't you? No, <laughs> but it's nice of you to say so. <laughs> I think you're the only person who calls me sweet. Um, uh, uh, yeah. That's only in public. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, what's going on? So we know better than that. So, so, you know, what, what is it about politics? I know people who know us know that, you know, you and I can sit around and chop it up about politics all day long. We could talk about policies. We could talk about, you know, um, we, we can be str strategists when it comes to, to politics. But I don't think I've ever really asked you this. What What is it about politics that draws you in? Ah, well, gotcha. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I, I don't know that it's... I don't know that it's quite the politics of it as much as it's the public service aspect mm. of it for me personally. Mm -hmm. um, I like politics. I like um, the things that people do, but it it's more about what happens once people get elected and what they're mm. doing afterward that is most interesting to me. Um, and kind of watching how people get to that space is, you know, that that's part of it. But it's the it's the service, it's the policies, it's the way that it impacts people. That's what really draws me in. And I, I think at at heart, my hope is that people who are serving in elected office are there to make their world a better place, whether they're looking at it on the very smallest level, um, or if they're looking at it on the greater like nationwide level my hope is that people are just trying to make the world a better place. I know there are people who get into it for ego or some people who, for some reason, think they can get rich doing it. I haven't figured out that. Well, they, they, you know, but, AOC said, you know, all of them in, at the state, at the, you know, in Congress are wealthy. I mean, it, it, yeah, they are. But I mean, that's a different kind of <laughs> different group altogether. But that's why I got involved. And also, I mean, I grew up, one of my earliest memories was of a presidential election and knowing that my mother would be unhappy that that particular president had been elected that day. Mm. Um, and so, and I was a, a little kid and, you know, being on the playground and hearing that that president had been elected and thinking, oh, my mom's going to be so mad, you yeah. know, yeah. and I was, I was young, yeah. but I knew that. And so, and I grew up in Iowa, so we had a whole different political system. Iowa. Don't make any cracks about Iowa. Iowa. State of black. Oh my gosh, she's bringing up Iowa. Oh, it's a Those great dang. state. I, I, wait a minute, yeah. time out. Uh, no. How are your people feeling that they may lose their caucus? <laughs> you know, I haven't talked to anybody about it yet. So I'm- How are you feeling I'm, about it? I'm a little sad. Because you Almost know the 2020 was a fiasco. Anyway, <laughs> so back to the question. 
We're not even going to go down that route. You can't help yourself, can you? I couldn't because, I mean, literally, because of that, everything is changing. No, it's not just because of that. Part of it is the demographics. Part of it is part of how it things is. Come. But but so it just let's that was like not the, say that it's because of that one time that one. No, thing okay, was, you're right. I won't say it's because of that one thing, but it was you know one of the piles. It was it, unfortunate, it, it, but it's not the end of the world. Mm, 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 so, mm, and they'll do better next time. You learn from mistakes if they get it next time. They will, of course, they're going to get it next time. They're going to have elections. Yeah, but it's they're talking the, about they're talking about taking away the first. Yeah, but they're talking about taking away well, the caucus and just having a primary. I know, but it's okay. It'll be fine. You It'll sound, be fine. You do sound sad. I mean, I see it in your eyes. You just all of a sudden <laughs> you just got oh, we can't Wait, be number one. Husband. Huh? I need to put those on. Like, where are my sons? I mean, I really felt that. it. Like, we can't be number one. <laughs> well, I mean, well, you a cool. Hoosier now, so it don't even matter. Like, you a Hoosier, I mean, you know. But anyway, um, back to back to what yeah. we was talking about. What was we talking about? I don't remember politics. We were talking well, about oh, politics. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What, and what, how we got into what, it. And that, that's, public I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, public service and helping your community. And yeah. that's it. I mean, that's, that's it. a good thing. Yeah. And there are lots of people who do it in lots of different ways, but politics is the thing that interests me. So, okay. And so what, uh, what other things do you do in your spare time? <laughs> 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 well, you know, um, in my spare time. So I serve on the state Democratic Party as the deputy chair for cities and towns. What? I am a oh, silly woman. I am the president of the Monroe County Black Democratic Caucus here in, in Bloomington. And um, I also am the co-chair of the Good Trouble Network, which is a national network of Black queer, um, black queer elected officials. So that's some of what I do in my spare time. I also, oh gosh. And I'm also the secretary treasurer for the Indiana League of Municipal Clerks and Treasurers. Ain't you forgot something? What else did I forget? See, I'm about to take your rainbow pin from you. I just talked about the Good Trouble Network and you're talking about the Stonewall. <laughs> I'm taking it away. Y'all hear that, Indiana? She don't, she don't even remember. She sit on a whole board. <laughs> I remember I said, I, I was talking about the leadership roles. I wasn't talking about, you know, doesn't all the- matter. doesn't matter. You know what? I think- oh, if, I, you, if you want me to go through those too, I mean, come on. I, but mean, yeah. I, think, I think it's cool to like be of service and not be, not necessarily have a title in the organization. I think that's I cool think, too. I think it's important to do that. And quite honestly, I think more people need to get involved um, because sometimes there's work that cannot just be done by the officers yeah. in organizations. And so, but you asked what I do in my spare time and those yes. are the things that are taking up the bulk of my spare time. So, um, and with Stonewall, which I love the organization, I love the people on the board in particular. Um, I'm not spending as much time as I was say a year ago when I yeah. was doing a lot more of the committee chair and yeah, officer. I think you were head of like five committees. <laughs> you were the ranking <laughs> member and you were like, uh, hello. <laughs> I mean, that no, was, it was, it was, you know, it was a strange time, but it's, it's good. And I really enjoy the work that everybody's doing. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's like, I like working on the, with the caucuses because um, there's power in those caucuses. I mean, that's that's how you you know create the. In my opinion, the party can create those direct lines into communities who are typically underserved and don't believe that the party is there for them. I mean, I, I, I I'm gonna throw her name out there, and I know she probably gets tired of me talking about her, but I I think about Samantha Douglas all the time, and, and ah. where she, and where she was when I met her, and what she's doing now. Like, oh. she, yeah, I mean, she is just. So Amazing. flat out amazing. I yeah. was actually texting with her right before we got started. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. She, she's 
talented and smart and passionate yeah. and is doing good things in her community. And my God, I cannot wait to see what else she does. And, you know, you look at people like that around the state because you've got people like Ariel Brandy and Samantha and um, a, who a else? A plethora of women and people I mean, of there's color. So, yeah, there's so many, too many to name. And so you need a lot of the constituency caucuses. You need the Young Dems. You need Stonewall. You need IDAC. You need all of these organizations because they're reaching into communities that the party as a whole mm -hmm. hasn't always been able to, but yeah. bring them through and into the political process. And we are going to get the people who are going to be running mm -hmm. this work through those organizations. And yeah, um, ooh, yeah. I, I, so I love it. I need to discount Stonewall because yeah, I reckon. Okay. But you know how I feel about Stonewall. You know, that's like oh, my baby. I, I know. I know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Indiana's on Dana Black. So let me ask you this. You know, um, you're running for re-election mm -hmm. and you, you know, every, there's always an opportunity to improve what you all do in the office. What are some of the things that you're hoping to improve on um, in this next term? So do you want the list? Um, the big thing is we need to be more, one of the things I'm working on is accessibility. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Or the records that we produce. Oh, okay. um, it, it's, we produce a lot of just information and minutes and everything else, but making sure that they're accessible to the community and to people who need them and not just in terms of availability, like, oh yeah, they're in a book or, oh yeah, they're on the website, but making sure that they're readable mm -hmm. for anybody who may have a visual impairment or anything else, or so that other systems in place or software can pick it up and read it back to them. So there are some things that we have in place right now that aren't very accessible in that way. And I want to work on that. I also want to help the city council um, as requested, or if they will allow it to um, revamp some of our procedures for the city to make the way that we do things overall smoother, because right now it's a little um, clunky, I guess would be the nice way to put it in terms of our procedures and we just need to update some of our code and make sure that people are going through meetings and know what to expect and when to expect it and don't get bogged down in some of the minutia of how the meeting is supposed to be run as opposed to what we're supposed to be discussing mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um because you are definitely right. a, 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 a you can run a heck of a meeting like i've seen you like this is a 30 minute meeting we're done in 28 minutes <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to give you two minutes of your time back. <laughs> it's a gift. I mean, I think if people are taking the time to come to a meeting, we should be running them efficiently and smoothly and make sure that they're able to get what they need from the meeting afterwards. So those are my goals. And the rest of them are things that are ongoing. I mean, the clerk's office, we uh, came in with a bit of a backlog for some of our records and we're still working our way through them. It's it's a process, but I'm enjoying what I'm doing with the people that I'm doing it with. So, and we were able to hire somebody new this last year. So now we're actually speeding up with our work and I'm so grateful for it. I love it. I love it. And let's see, what's the, I got a lot of questions. Me and you talk all the time. So sometimes I forget what we talked about and I don't ever give okay. anybody um, questions. Oh, I know. Okay. So uh, there's a lot of good stuff happening. You have some plans for the future. Mm -hmm. um, so how was the campaign going? Well, we just, just officially started, you know, yesterday. So, so far it's, it's okay. I think this next month is going to be a bit of a waiting to see who all files in the primary Bloomington. Um, right now, all of the elected officials are Democrats. So, and that's been the case for a while. So, our primaries tend to be more consequential than the general election because that's mm -hmm. how the votes tend to run. So the next month or so will be a little tense. I'm waiting to see who files, not just in the clerk's race though, but we have 
three mayoral candidates here in Bloomington. We've got several people who are filing for council at large. And then I think we're going to have a few contested district races as well. So this is going to be a very interesting primary season, not just for myself, but for others. And for my campaign, we are really working on the same campaign plan, whether there's one opponent or 20 opponents, it's the same message. So, um, okay. so do you have any events coming up? We, yes, we have a kickoff party coming on the 21st and I'll be posting it on my Facebook account, which is Nicole Molden and Instagram and website, which is Nicole .com. I think those are the three main outlets. I have a Twitter account, but I, do not use it well. So don't bother yeah, looking at it. Twitter. I mean, I get it. I mean, Twitter's still a kind of a good it the platform is good. It's just full of controversy. It's weird, yeah, it's a weird space. So yeah. But so far the campaign's going okay. And again, please click on the Act Blue link. I would be enormously grateful. And we'll take any amount, five dollars, ten dollars, you know, more if you have it, but that's okay. Um, because elections cost money, and that is the hardest part about campaigning, which is trying to remind people that we're asking for money so that we can make Bloomington a better place. I love it. I love it. I want to thank you so much for being my first guest of the year, Clerk Nicole Bolden of Bloomington. I ain't going to lie. You helped me get the rust knocked off. It's been a while. It's been a few, couple of months since I've been on air. Uh, a friendly face to make the transition from not doing the show to doing the show. So I really appreciate you letting me do that. I know you having a girl's night later on. So uh, I, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I just want to thank wow. you. Hey, I do want to ask you one thing though. Okay. Have you been watching what's going on with Congress? Have I been watching? Like, have you been watching? <laughs> Because I think they're about to pull the eleventh vote for uh, uh, the clown I, show. You it's, mean not, it's? I mean, are you watching? I cannot believe it. I actually got to watch one of the votes because I've been at work and so I haven't been able to like sit and just watch it. But I got to watch one today, and I was just I was amazed. And yeah, I've I've seen um nine nine of them. I watched mm -hmm. nine of because I I get to you know work remotely and I have it on as white noise um, so that I can stay focused on the work and I've listened to all the speeches I've listened to all the shade that they are throwing at everybody um, and when they nominated the brother from Florida oh you Hakeem Jeffries you know you know because it was historic we were like we're casting a vote for the first person to run for speaker in the Democratic Party with Hakeem Jeffries but then they was like well we got Donald. We go, we gonna throw Donald up so we can make history too, you know. I, I, the, the, so the, the 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 nonsense and the chicanery and all of that old, you know, um, you know. First of all, McCarthy is not; he doesn't have the votes. Even Bobo said it. Bobo said you don't have the votes. And then she took a shot at Trump. She took a shot at Trump, talking about we should cut it out. No, he need to cut it out. Go tell McCarthy to cut it out. I, listen, how many more times do we have to say McCarthy is a spineless weasel? I don't think I have ever said that. I, I've i said it. I'm but saying I don't it. call people weasels. So oh, right. Is there a reason? No, I just don't. That's not, not the insult for you? people use. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. okay. You've heard my words. Yeah. I, 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 not one of them. Okay, but I, I, say, so. I say weasel because, like, you know, it keeps me from cursing. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? But I, yeah. I mean, he, you know, I mean, what, just watch his actions for the last two years, right? <clears throat> we have the insurrection. He blasts Trump and the administration um, like an hours after the administration. But then the following weekend, he's down there kissing the ring. Oh, baby, baby, please, Mr. Trump, take me back, baby, 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 please. And and then he's oh. enabled the Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Matt Gates, the Jim Jordans, the Boberts. And all these people, and now when they turn on him, he don't understand. He's given the whole, like the things that they're asking for, like they're saying we want a rule change that says that one person can recall, call for a vote to recall the Speaker of the House. Yeah. Oh my God, the crazy, I mean, but this is what happens. that They letting 20 people 
hijack the Republican Party. But that's what the hell they get. You keep. Yeah. That's what that's what they get. They you know the I'm still miffed about the Herschel Walker thing. You gotta let that go. I will, but I'm sure you gotta let it go. Georgia, let it go. <laughs> I, I will, but you know they. But, but that lets you know what they think about black people. That's some, that's that lets you know what they, they that's a clear indication of what Republicans and how they feel about black people. And so when they put you know Representative Donald up. You know, it was, it wasn't, that wasn't their first choice. That It was a, let's put a black dude up. Now, I'm not saying Brian Smart, he won his election. He's a Republican. He does what he does. I'm not saying any of that, but they, they don't, they're not thinking about you until they can use you. And then once they can use you, they put you up there. Okay. So the only thing I would say in maybe mild disagreement with you is that I don't think that's behavior that is exclusive to one party or another. No, it's not. But people at least... will do that across the board, and it, it's it's maybe more obvious in this particular case. But it's not like this is just no, their thing. No, I mean, it's not. People but at will least... use others whenever they can, and that goes across party issues, and that goes across race issues. People are. People use people are going to people. Yes, I think but, I but the said. pandering is what I'm talking about. It was uh, Hakeem Jeffries wasn't oh. a pander. Hakeem Jeffries was groomed. He was he was brought up through the ranks to be the leader of the party, not an afterthought. And when I become an afterthought, then you're being used. And I'm sorry, I I, I can't get with that. I I mean, well, it's, it's different. And don't get me wrong, there are users. Yes, people use, but they literally use black folk. And sometimes people, black folk who are not necessarily prepared for the role that they're, because he's this, he's he's only in his second term. Is he really prepared to be the Speaker of the House? The Speaker of the House? No idea. But you know what? He's that's not. who they're voting for. And I don't think he's going to become the Speaker no, he's of the not. House. But that's, so, and I feel what you're saying, but no. Nah. Let it, you know, like, I'm like, ah, this is, it's not a surprise. It's that, not a surprise. It's not but, a surprise. It's just gross. It's very but gross. It's not exclusive to the Republican so do you, Party. So do you all. think McCarthy should stop? You think he should like drop out or so, should he just keep giving away the farm until he gets enough votes peeled off? I mean, at this point, how much, how, how effective is he going to be as speaker? Mm -hmm. That's my question. Like, I, I think your, your first job is to count your votes. Uh, yeah. So first, my friend, yeah, count. So what, what is the strategy here? That's my question. Like, what are you, what are you doing? Are you like trying to just wear people down? Are you giving them more? I don't understand what's happening here, but I'm I'm just curious about if he becomes speaker, how effective he'll be, and what the other options are. And that's I think well, that's Matt, Matt Gates, watching this and kind of going, this is bizarre. Well, well, Matt Gates offered up Donald Trump. I heard. Yeah. Why would you yeah. see? The, see, the, it's wow. how can I take them seriously? How can I take well, these people seriously? You know, the interesting thing is, at least he's busy because he's running for re-election as president. You know, <laughs> I, I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say this, and. And I'm probably gonna piss some people off. I appreciate people who want to seek office and the entry point at which they choose to seek office, I'm cool with. You know, if you wanna run for an office and you've never, you wanna run for an elevated office and you've never run for office before and you feel like you can do it, cool. But I ask that you do your homework. I ask that you know the rules. I ask that you understand how to win. I need you to know what a win number is. I, you know what I'm saying? I don't mind that you want to run, but if you don't know what the heck you're doing, sit your behind down or go well, learn. And you, and you see that a lot now with people who are running for office, which is, I mean, and I know we just jumped off of McCarthy, but there are people who run for office. They've never run for office. They've never worked on a political campaign. They've never been near a political campaign. That's okay. but do some reading. Oh my God. You know, there are books. If you don't want to read a book, watch a video, watch a webinar. If you don't want to go to a webinar, go to a training. If you don't want to do those three things, 
they're like little short two page or three page PDFs that can give you the very, very bare bones of how to run a campaign and getting into office. And that makes me just nutsy bobo because I, you know, I, you see people and also then you see people who are running for office for the first time who don't really know any of the structure. And, um, if they're not willing to learn, they make mistakes that they don't have to make. Exactly. And then and, and it, it's frustrating because yeah. then it's kind of one of those, you can see that somebody would be really good in the job, the elected office, but they're horrible candidates. Horrible candidates. And, or, you know, it, so I think your first job is to at least learn, learn about how to be a candidate. I mean, when I, when I ran for learn how to do the office or uh, what it entails, yeah. which I guess comes back to Kevin McCarthy, which is one of the things he needed to learn was how many votes he needed and to actually have a plan for getting those know, votes. I think he already knew he needed to count the votes. I think he thought that in, in his, in his arrogant way that they were just going to do what he, I, I needed, he needed them to do. He didn't believe, I don't think he believed that they wouldn't vote for him because the, I mean, he's been sitting there 11 times. Like, I don't think he, I, I honestly believe he thought that they were just going to do the right thing because typically that's what people do. And if you listen to the arguments that these, the 20 are making, it's, you know, I, I don't want to just pass a bill that I ain't read. And that's all they keep talking about. Only four or five people are passing these bills. It's the same thing. It's just, they're saying the same thing. So basically what it is, is like, you keep telling us we are supposed to do a thing and you ain't, ain't talked to us. So, so McCarthy, I think in his arrogance, thought that, and then he had Trump come in talking about vote for him. He thought that he was going to get what he needed. And I don't think it, I don't think he didn't know how to count because he's been doing this for, they've been doing this since the election, since they knew the results, and since he, before it. Well, and he was one of the, wasn't he one of the young guns? You remember those? I, I do not recall. It was uh, <laughs> him, Paul Ryan, and there was a third. Oh, I'm blanking on it. But there were three of them. They all came in and they were all just, they were all young and uh, gung-ho at the same time. Um, I don't know. Like Paul Ryan or whatever. Eric Cantor, Eric Cantor Paul Ryan, and oh, Eric, yeah. Eric Cantor, Paul Ryan, and uh, McCarthy. And they all and, came in together. I think he's kind of the last one hanging out still. Yeah, because Eric Cantor got outflanked to the right. If you, yeah. could, you know, I remember that. I remember that. I don't know. It and then just... left. And so anyway, I just, I, I've been watching. It's been one of those things where I'm just kind of going, this is, this is happening. And at the same time, the business of the country is not being done. Well, no, I mean, but, Senate's doing some stuff. They've yeah, all gotten, but you, you, you can't have a functioning government with only one branch. Well, yeah. with, one, with one branch out, not doing anything, put it like that. Half of a branch since they're all the legislative branch, right? Well, yeah, yeah, half a branch. I mean, yeah, it's, but, but it's not it's functioning. Difficult. It's not functioning. No. Well, no, they're functioning. They're just not moving forward. That, that's, <laughs> no, I'm not, they're not even, no, they're not doing anything. No one's been sworn in in the House. I know. They're all elects right now. Yeah, so is, it's, that means it's not functioning, right? I mean, fair. it's not. I mean, if you don't have anybody elect, and nobody, they can't even talk about classified information because they're still not sworn in it's crazy i just i i think it's like but this is what they get this is what they get they've been doing this for years putting up clowns to run in these house seats and now there's enough of them to cause damage i think i've watched more um votes or more time on congress in the last like just just today, this afternoon, than I have like in the last six months, yeah. and which yeah. is a shame because yeah. we should be paying attention. But I tend to pay more attention at the local level. Yep, and I'm gonna be tuning in next week at the state house. So I got you. I'll be watching that. But I want to say this last thing about uh, the DC thing. You know, oh, okay. um, w if McCarthy had any, um, if he if his if his intelligence was nuanced. He would definitely have gone back and read read every Nancy Pelosi book. And let me tell you why. Do you remember when the squad came in? Yeah. And they were like, enough of this old people stuff. 
we want fresh, we want new stuff, we want, we want, and they came in gung ho. Whatever Nancy Pelosi did, she became the leader again. True. She was voted in. Those those young ladies, those ladies were like, the squad was like, it's time to go. And she had the same amount of uh, lead that McCarthy does now. A real leader, a true leader, knows how to talk to the people who are disagreeing with you and get them on board. And that's what McCarthy is unable to do because he's not a leader. He just yeah. wants to be the speaker. And that and therein lies the problem. I just want to be the speaker. I, I don't, you can take it away from me tomorrow. I just want to be the speaker. So there's that. All right. Indiana's on Dana Black. Clerk, Clerk, uh, Clerk Nicole oh. Bolden. Again, thank you. <laughs> thank you again for, for, you know, letting me pop the cap off this 2023 election cycle. Um, I have more guests coming. I'm going to, I'm excited about how many mayors I've already reached out to or mayor or candidates that I've reached out to who are looking to run. I'm going to try to bring as many of those on the show this year as I possibly can. Obviously I want to bring more city county council or city county, city council folk, Unigov, Unigov. Um, and I know of at least now two city clerks who are running for office and I'm going to make sure that I bring, uh, the candidate from, from wherever, uh, I'm not going to tell, cause I don't know if they've announced, <laughs> right. I can't say, I know, um, I know. right. I'm so excited. Though. Right. I, I, I make sure I get all those folks, uh, on the show. And if you guys listen, if there's somebody you want me to try to reach out to, to get on the show, uh, let me know. I am going to try to bring the, uh, state party chair on before the primary season gets heated up. I, I've been emailing with him, trying to make it around his schedule um, so that he can like come on in and chop it up with us before the primaries get all down and dirty. Um, so we, you know, we want to recap last year and then uh, what he has planned from that perspective. But this is your place, y'all, to find out about the candidates. This is the place where you come and hear about the policies that are happening in the state house. The general assembly session starts next week. So, you know, I'm going to be tuned in. Um, and if you listen, I tell you guys all the time, you there's hundreds and hundreds of bills that are being introduced. There's no way one person can look at all those bills. You have a couple of options, several options, actually. One is whatever area of life that you are most interested in, there's a search on the General Assembly website and anything that is associated with that word search, you can find a bill that's associated with it. And then you read those bills or you can get you and your whole bunch of your homies together and y'all can divide the bills up, right? There's multiple ways because every, I try to remind y'all, the state house where I'm sitting in tonight, kind of, sort of, <laughs> the state house is where the power is. What do you mean, Indiana Zone? Well, the state house can determine whether or not a policy comes down from the Fed level and gets implemented statewide, i.e., Obamacare, and they can also determine what they what you can do at the municipal level, i.e. Indianapolis being the only city council in the entire state that does not have at-large seats. I need y'all to understand that. That's where the power is. So I will, you know me, I'm always focused there, but Bloomington City Clerk, I mean, I love hanging out down there. No, I'm not moving. Everybody wants me to move down there. I'm not coming. <laughs> But I thank you for joining me and popping the popping the cork off this bad boy. Happy New Year! Uh, I wish Happy you the best of luck. And uh, tell us again when your fundraiser kickoff is. January twenty first. I will post it. Excellent. All know. right. And in the meantime, if you can't make it or if you want to come and send it, you can hit my app blue link. Hit that app blue link. Indiana's yes. on Dana Black. Uh, I have a show scheduled for you. I got a mayor coming on next week. But in the meantime, y'all have a wonderful rest of the night. I'll holler at y'all later. Peace.